Hello and welcome to UCD's centenary of Kevin Barry, who was executed on the 1st of November 1920. Today I'm joined by Mary Daly, Chief Roe Donovan, and Eunan O'Halpin, who you have just heard papers by. I'd now like to talk to these three authors and historians about their research on the life and times of Kevin Barry, and to look at both how Kevin Barry lived in his short life, but also on how his death was transformed, both in terms of martyrology, in a national sense, and in terms of family memory. And I'm conscious here that I have two relatives of the Barry family, in both Shifra and Yunan, who will speak not only to the role that their relative played in Irish national history, but also to the way in which that memory was preserved within different sections of the family and within different traditions and what Kevin Barry meant um, to them, I suppose, growing up and within their family tradition. So Shifra, I might go to you first and ask you about what the kind of Kevin Barry that was portrayed to you in life was. Um, how did your relatives speak about Kevin Barry and what are your earliest memories and how did your journey, I suppose, through researching Kevin Barry change that? Well, as I was growing up, uh, my father talked to me an awful lot about um, Kevin Barry. We never sang the song. I don't think many people in any branch of the extended family did. My grandmother, Monty, said that the song was maudlin and wouldn't have it sung. Um, so that wasn't certainly wasn't part of how we recollected Kevin Barry. Um, it's this portrait here right behind me that hung in my father's study, which he called the Republican plot. He had a sign on the door of his study saying the Republican plot. So there was Kevin Barry and there was my grandfather, Jim, and they, Jim looked very stern and Kevin looked always very friendly. I thought a little bit like Tintin. And um, I hugely admired him growing up. Um, I understood him, I, I perceived him as a human being. My father would tell me the stories of him, you know, cycling around Wicklow um, from Hackettstown up to Glendalough, falling in the ditch. He would have read me some letters. Um, he was amusing, he was sophisticated, um, he was, um, but then we came to the to the ambush and the recollections and the accounts of, of that and I would have written about that um, in a school essays and um, would have focused on that. Um, it was uh, there was a huge sense of that we were growing up under under the shadow of something quite big, but I never perceived him personally as a martyr in the sense that Pierce was a martyr, the sacrifice of blood, a Christ like thing, never. Um, it was very much as a human, a human being, a person who enjoyed life, who was at college, who had certainly, he was not as serious minded as my own grandfather, whose serious mindedness went to extremes. Um, and my own father would have struggled um, with that level of extremity. Who knows how Kevin Barry would have been if he had lived? Would he have gone on to simply be a middle class doctor in Dublin in some suburb? Probably. Um, but um, my grandfather, Jim, was somebody who would never um, let go of his ideal of a united Ireland. So there were the two in my life growing up. There were the two. So it changed when I started researching um, to some extent because I had to read through a lot of military documents, a lot of witness statements, and it was a uh, hugely burdensome. Um, um, of course, I drew very much from my father's book. I never saw my grandfather's book. It just, I asked many people and I never actually found it. I've never seen it with my own eyes. My father would have drawn from the interviews that my grandfather would have done with Carlo IRA volunteers on the ground, mm -hmm. like Matt Cullen, who was instrumental on the day of going to Okavana to burn down the, the barracks. Um, so those accounts were were fascinating. I was able to corroborate those with local people down in Carlo, um, particularly last summer, the summer before last, and um, to hear people who were indirectly or directly connected, who were of um, that generation, much older generation. They won't be around for much longer, so it's good that I got them mm. on time, but they would have corroborated those accounts that Matt Cullen had given my grandfather. So there were pieces of the jigsaw. And yes, I saw um, Kevin very much as, yeah, very uh, experienced in um, military activity. And, mm. you know, going down to Carlo for the summer in 1920 was not just, sure he had great fun, sure he was off on his bike and he was getting drunk and having great fun up in Glendalough and picking up girls. But at the same time, he was very, very focused and very, very serious minded. 
about you know um, what he was going to get up to with the sea company down in Carla. And as Unan already said, um, Michael Barry was in, very active himself from 1917 in the sea company in Carlo and Kevin Barry's sister, Shell Barry, was in the coming of man down there. Kitby wasn't. And um, I personally feel that Kitby might have been a little bit envious of her younger yeah. sister, Shell. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's it, really. Great, thanks. And Eunan, you you grew up, I suppose, in the same lineage on a different branch of, of that uh, family tree that I suppose in Kevin's line was cut short. What other aspects of Kevin's memory were, I suppose, particularly apparent or particularly strong in the way that he was remembered to you? Or when did you first become conscious of this one branch of your of your um, family with several Republican? Well, we're, 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 we're pretty early about, about Kevin. It was just part of the, the furniture. Uh, in a sense, particularly from my from my grandmother, from that grandmother, but but uh, as I, I said earlier, it, 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 I didn't know then that I had other that all of my all of my grandparents old enough to be involved uh, were were in fairly senior positions in the independence movement. I didn't know that my my grandmother's husband's brother had been killed. I didn't know his father's house had been burnt down in, in Tipperary. I had to, in a sense, find all these things out after my grandmother died. It's a very weird kind of curatory exercise. I think she, she was quite right. I think my, my grandmother slips around the question. She was a great preparer. She prepared an amazing Bureau of Military History statement. But there are other, there's evidence that that's a very refined and, and sort of finished product, if you like. In fact, she, she got into a row with, with Shifa's grandfather, Jim O'Donovan, uh, later on, it was late in 1964, when, when, when he was deviating, in her view, from the, from the sort of the, the sacred text. Um, so uh, it was really mainly the song probably was the thing. And the other thing, the odd thing is you were introduced to lots of people as a grandnephew of Kevin Barry. Out of the blue, it, 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 nobody said I was a grandnephew of Paddy Maloney, also killed, or of, uh, of Huey Hayton, who was a well-known county town Republican, or her grandson. There's none of that. It was always Kevin. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I want to move on, though. I think part of the point about Kevin is he's a friend of mine uh, in, in school, in Gonzaga, like you, a Jesuit school, said to his father that, who, had, who had played sport with Kevin in Bel Belvedere, in, in the late 1990, 19, 19, said, oh, in the 1970s, said, well there's, well, there's no difference between what Kevin did and what the provosts are doing now. And his father was a very respectable, uh, uh, blue shirt, whatever, businessman. So it was appalled and shocked at the comparison, right? Mm -hmm. And Kevin has become, I think, for middle class Ireland, a kind of almost a kind of alibi. So, yes, we took part too, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not, it's not his fault that it, that it's the case. And he had what what interests me about Kevin and Jesuit memory, is uh, is he he is taken. I was speaking in Belvedere last week to an empty courtyard about Kevin. Uh, and, you know they they mounted a, a Zoom type event for him without any obviously without anyone present really. But what struck me there was I, I said well is there are you, I didn't say it on on screen but I was wondering what are they going to do about Cahill Brewer. Who was the first president of Doyle Aaron, mm. uh, who, 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 you know, who fought heroically in 1916 and who died less than half a mile away down the road in 1922. And on the political side, on, on the anti retreaty side, he's by far the sort of uh, strongest ideologue. What are the James mm. going to do about Roy, Roy O'Connor, the military leader, mm. the anti treaty side of the, the Four Courts, a Clongos boy, right? What are they going to do again about Jim Donovan, the chief of his grandfather, another Jesuit boy? My own grandfather was on Liam Lynch's staff, a Jesuit boy. His brother, Con Maloney, the adjutant general, a Jesuit boy. And the curious thing is that, that the, even within the weird world of Irish Jesuitry, and Jesuitry may be the word, they have chosen to use Kevin as their icon. Uh, but they're always associated you know, with Kevin O'Higgins and with kind of pro-treatyite and establishment and well-to-do doctors and lawyers. But in fact, the anti-treaty, the man who shot uh, Sir Henry Wilson in, in London, who educated him, you've guessed it, the Jesuits. So I think uh, one of the oddities of researching this is it's taken to be this curious, curious issue of to what extent Kevin uh, becomes an icon, not only for, as nowadays you'll find a lot of in Republican areas in the North, there are lots of Kevin Barry's christened every year. Mm -hmm. you, you know, the name really resonates there for youthful sacrifice and conscious sacrifice, not sort of childishness. But also, uh, he has a sort of a cross-class appeal, which in some ways is, is, is unusual. It's a bit like Terence McSweeney, but McSweeney's remembered as Lord Mayor of Cork, not as a rather ineffective uh, commander of the, you know, of the Cork Number 1 Brigade, 
right? And I think there's a thing about class in here and sort of respectability, if you like, of, of the independent struggle, which, which I haven't teased out yet, but I think Kevin is part of it. Mary, do you want to come in on that question of class and image? It, it, it strikes me that there are two things in particular that are utilised in that martyrology of Kevin Barry. One is his youth and that youthful image. And even, Chief, we can see it in that striking portrait behind you that Kevin's life being cut short in, in a slightly different way to Terence McSweeney's slightly less youthful life at 41 when his life was cut short. Is the other aspect of this class, do you think that class plays a major role in this, Mary? I, I, I do think it, he, it does. I mean, I think you, I, I, I was really enjoying what Yuna was saying there about the Jesuits and, and all those figures because they, they do contrast with the images, as I said, of the murder gang of those slightly shady, you know, the kind of people that you get as extras in some of those films. Uh, he's very much the antithesis to that. And then when you get into UCD medical student as well, and I think the UCD dimension is, is quite important there because it is, it, he is showing that, the, that this revolution and the battle was, was, was one that did bring in um, some of the Irish elite at the time because they, this, this, you know, very lively social set that you get around the young women and the young men. Um, they're by and large better educated than the average. They're not, they're not wealthy, but they're, they're not impoverished either. And uh, Kevin Barry does epitomise that. And what is very interesting the way is the way that he was embraced then by his medical class. I mean, the Kevin Barry went, there's, there's no other a uh, memorial of that era uh, that is remotely resembles the Kevin Barry window uh, and the fact that it was placed in, in, in Earth for Terrace. I used to sit through James Meenan's National Economics lectures, wow. you know, and looking up, looking up the stained glass. So it, it did, it meant that his name was known to generations of those students who who who, who studied in Earlsford Terrace. And again, it is bringing the whole revolutionary movement into a, a, a more middle class uh, environment. I, I think that's such an interesting point as well, because I suppose at the time, the propaganda value of his class was that it was used in Britain to show that the IRA were not yeah, corner correct. boys, to use that quotation correct. from so many RIC reports, mm -hmm. but retrospectively that the use of this class is that it allowed elites in Ireland or the middle classes in Ireland to find their respectable place within the Irish Revolution, when mm -hmm. in fact the majority of fighters in the Irish Revolution, both men and women, were probably me uh, men and women of a much uh, poorer class, also by and large of a more agricultural class, and this kind yeah, of pop, pop, moves pop, the revolution yeah into the professions in terms of medicine into dublin um, and those kind of ways when mm. actually it's it's this boy from carlo who comes up um and, mm. and does all this so i think it's it's a very interesting juxtaposition of that mm. chief you referred to the the portrait behind you as as something your family referred to as the republican plot um i suppose could you talk about that more and particularly this idea of ownership of the bodies in stark contrast to terence mcsweeney um those who were executed like Roger Casement and, um, and Kevin Barry and the other forgotten nine, let's call them, they, their bodies were not handed over mm. to families. They were buried within the walls of the prison. What impact do you think that had in terms of the family commemoration or the family trauma that, that went with not having a body to grieve? And how did that change uh, the way in which Kevin was remembered within, within your side of the family? Well, first of all, um, Michael Collins was uh, very keen to have the body exhumed very quickly um, for the sake of the Barry family, who to whom he was very close, particularly to Kitby Barry, Eunan's mm -hmm. grandmother. Um, but that was quickly brushed aside with the, the trauma of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, and then Cathy Barry, um, she did, Kitby, um, had a few visits to Mount Joy and she was impressed with how the grave was kept, that it was kept meticulously well, as were the other graves. But this went on, you know, for, for decades, this uh, campaign um, to have the bodies respected and to be properly buried and to be buried with a significant ceremony. So um, it, it was through the National Graves Association and this went on uh, right up until um, the late 90s. And then by um, 
2000, things started to move and it took time for each of the families to agree to this as well. Some had different personal reasons for it not being. And there was one whose name I can't remember, one of the 10 whose family, Mar, I think it was, he wanted to be, they wanted him buried in their own home mm-hmm. town, which, which he was. So in fact, then in 2001, we had nine bodies which were reinterred. Um, I was very lucky, in fact, to meet Sean Reynolds, who oversaw the exhumation of the body and who saw and witnessed uh, with his own eyes um, the body as Kevin Barry's body as it was being exhumed, among others. But, you know, the detail of, you know, the mm-hmm. cufflinks, the detail of the boots, which were so well made back then that they were perfectly intact, mm-hmm. um, the waistcoat, um, things that would very much bring um, to quite in a way horrifically to life that you know the 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 things that had lasted um up to that point from 1920 up to 2001 um so the ceremony as i as you know i wasn't uh in fact there but i did um have the legacy of my father's um a huge file of newspaper cuttings from the time it was so interesting to see the different perspectives Mm -hmm. um on this that many thought that it was Fianna Foyle, you know, hijacking this as a propaganda kind of um, thing prior to elections. Um, and then you had commentaries from people like Fintan O'Toole, you know, that these mm. uh, these boys were reckless. Um, you had all sorts of different, different uh, perspectives on this. And of course, any kind of funeral is emotive for a family even, mm. and all sorts of extreme emotions come out, very tribal. Um, um, so this was an enormously um, significant and uh, very emotive um, event. Of course, I, I wish that I'd been there, but Kevin Barry um, in Carlo, who is, is still very much alive, um, who lives in the ancestral home, the Barry ancestral home, he, he said that he himself didn't really realize what Kevin Barry meant to people until he saw people trying to touch the glass. And this is where the, the sense of somebody being a, a martyr or, or being almost a saint, you know, that, that, that feeling, Tibetans do it as well with, with significant um, uh, stupas where like, high lamas are buried, you know, the relic tradition, you know, can I touch that? You know, can I get that blessing? So that's what he, he suddenly, well, he, he saw all these people do this, but my goodness, I didn't actually realize he meant so much to people. And it was the same as I said, growing up at home with my father and his uh, Republican plot. But dad was not in any way tongue in cheek about Kevin Barry, but he was certainly very wary of extremism due to his own father's extremism. So, um, yeah, I mean, I very much wish that I had been able to. I could have attended, but I was off in New York. I didn't know anything about Kevin Barry then. <laughs> Which links me very well. Uh, Unan, I was actually going to mention something that you mentioned in your book. I, I want to move on to the idea of diaspora here in a bigger sense. Um, you mentioned that the day after uh, Kevin Barry's execution, on the other side of the world, the British executed another Irishman, James yeah. Daly, for his role in the, um, the Connacht Rangers mutiny in India. Um, and Mary, you've also referenced, I suppose, the power that that execution had coming on foot of uh, Terence McSweeney's execution. So I suppose a, a question to, to all of you, to what extent is the diaspora harnessed and how important is this in terms of a global history of the Irish Revolution? So maybe Yunan, as, as you wanted to come in first, do you want to come in on, on any of that in the diaspora and the global picture? Uh, sure, yeah. Well, I, I think the, the diaspora element is enormously important, right? And it's, it's, it's important in two ways, not simply in mobilizing support particularly after the treaty for the continuing struggle uh, of the anti-treatyites. But also it's because I think the diaspora thing is, Kevin becomes so embedded in the diaspora, partly because he's recognized, not simply within the diaspora, but because he has registered uh, with sort of gen- with, with, with the general public mm-hmm. across the world. You didn't have to be an Irish Republican, you didn't have to be Irish. I quote a Polish newspaper in Chicago mm-hmm. about Kevin's execution. Mm-hmm. So I think he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a winner in a sense in terms of mo- mobilizing sentiment, not simply because we because the Irish abroad hear about how he heroically died and this and that and the other, but because other people who know nothing about Ireland, who aren't of the diaspora, that they already know of in the Times mm-hmm. of India, 
mentions and mm. you know you name it and i mm. looked at it, not that many but but scores of newspapers mm. wherever i could mm. find them around the world so there is that element you see what i mean so he's he, he, the, it's a, a reinforcing thing within the diaspora secondly i i think his name is very important mm. i think kevin barry is kind of musical it hangs together very well mm. and it's it, you see it, it you know it, it immediately gets given i mean i didn't do a thorough search because i didn't have time but in looking at, at birth registers and things, enlistment registers for militaries in Canada, Australia, and America, and casualty lists. There are loads of Kevin Barrys mm -hmm. there who die in the, in, in the Second World War, right? Uh, fighting for uh, Australia, the uh, uh, United States, and so on. So it has become a way of, of connecting, typically a diaspora back to, mm -hmm. back, back to Ireland. And I think the name, the name and the song, as Shifa said, and the imagery, and can I just say all that, that terrific, picture portrait that, that Schieffer has. The irony of that is Kevin, that's the most mature Kevin that's presented, but that doesn't get circulated until early 22. The original is in the Jesuit archives. There's a note on the back by the Father McGrath who took it in 1919, a group of boys, pillars of the house. And he writes on the back, early 1922, uh, the family asked, did I have any pictures? And so he, he, selected, that, he selected that. But if, the, if, if that had been circulated, do you see what I mean? He doesn't look as young as he does in his sports thing. So it was actually, whether by accident or design, I think the use of the sports images, the, mainly the hoop jersey, also one in a second a second 15 white jersey, which is on the 1921 uh, Buenos Aires, that bizarre pamphlet one. But, but they're really powerful because they, they speak of youth and health and so on. Whereas in some ways he looks a more dashing and interesting student type figure because he's got his trench coat on and so on. Mm -hmm. Even though in fact, he's only a, a sixth year, sixth boy, sixth year. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I think there is huge mm -hmm. maturation as well. Chief, you refer to this in your book when he goes and visits, I think the Doyles, um, when he's back in Carlo in that summer before his death, that when he calls to their door, the, the wife of the household is struck by how this young boy, Kevin has now become a man. And I think we are, brought between those two Kevins, you know, I suppose between the age of about 17 when he comes up to Dublin and, and uh, I suppose becomes more involved in IRA activity. And then really he is a man by the time um, he's captured in that raid in September of 1920. Mary, did you want to say anything on the, the diaspora aspect of this? Because I know you, you brought that up. Well, I mean, I agree with pretty well anything Ewan has said that I think if we're to understand the mem memorialization of all events to do with the uh, it, it, 1916 and the War of Independence, we have to move beyond the island and look at what is happening beyond it. And Kevin Barry reaches beyond it and agreed, he, he also reaches beyond the diaspora as such uh, because it, it is a hugely emotional story. I mean, bear in mind that you're dealing with a world in 1920 where there's an awful lot of families that have lost men of Kevin Barry's generation in the Great War. There's a lot of mothers, there's a lot of sisters, and I think therefore there's a resonance uh, that it, that's really, he, he brings back those kind of memories. I think the other thing, and I thought maybe that Shifu would deal with it, is the whole question of the women and the keepers of the flame. And the fact that all the descriptions of the vigil uh, emphasize the women at, uh, outside. And women are so important in the memorialization of both the 1916 and the later, the later, the later people. And I, and I think, you know, his appeal to women, the fact that he has powerful women in his own family, I think all those things are extremely important as well. Shifra, do you like to come in that on the women in Kevin Barry's life? Yeah, um, there were significant women from an early age. Uh, because his father died when he was six years old, I think um, the influence of, of women was completely inevitable. Um, he died in 1908, uh, yeah, Kevin was six, and there was this uh, housekeeper in number eight Fleet Street in the Dublin house, um, Kate Kinsler, who uh, would have been very wary of any violent means um, to 
to gaining independence uh, because she had her own personal associations with the Invincibles and the Phoenix Park murders uh, back in the 19th century. So uh, she, but then after 1916, she completely turned and Kitby in her witness statement describes her lighting a candle, a candle at an altar to um, the men when they were executed. So mm -hmm. there was that turn, but she apparently would have, you know, had her uh, quite a, a significant amount of stories and she would have sung a lot of um songs uh, and ballads to the kids in the Barry house. So that's not hard to imagine at all, really. Kitby, of course, was um, a huge influence on, on Kevin. Um, she was older than him. She took on, when her, when their aunt Judith Barry, who was taking care with a lot of the Dublin dairy uh, lands up in Pimlico, um, she was a forthright woman. Um, she hadn't married. Um, she then died in 1912. So Kevin was seven, eight, nine or 10. Um, um, but Kitby then, she stood in and she said, well, I, I'm going to manage um, the affairs of this family now. And Mrs. Barry was a very strong woman, but my father would have described her as being a more gentle person than Kitby. Yeah. Kitby was more similar to Judith Barry, who was quite domineering, basically. Um, so he had the influence of, of all of them. And then um, in his afterlife, um, you know, Kit, Kitby would have held back from being a member of Coming to Man until um, after his uh, his execution. Um, and um, Union can tell you about all of her, you know, um, involvement in the um, um, activities during the Civil War and her fundraising in America and Australia, um, as requested by, by De Valera. But interestingly then, um, yeah, just in terms of the context of, of women in the war and Elgin O'Rahilly, who was fairly young, um, a teenage, teenager, when Kevin was executed, um, she would have then in the Civil War gone on to um, be very active in Coming to Man and was a hunger striker in the North Dublin Union as well. Um, there's quite a lot to do with that in the UCD archives, as, as, you, as you know. Um, and further back um, on the O'Rahilly side, there had been Anya O'Rahilly, who had been very active in the foundation of Coming On and very active herself. So there were, you know, th there was that going in the background, but Kevin wouldn't have been aware of the O'Rahillys because it was later that Elgin, or Elgin um, Barry married um, Mac O'Rahilly. Um, but I think, yeah, overall, there were a lot of significant women in Kevin's life. And then, of course, just in terms of how he viewed women, I mean, as Union said earlier on, um, you know, perhaps the, the, what he wrote, how he wrote about women in his in his letters might be seen as inappropriate um, today. But we can see that he certainly had the ability to form strong friendships yes. um, with women um, in his university life, obviously not in Belvedere so much because it was an all boys school. Um, but he had, you know, a, a very, very varied kind of experience of of women. Um, in his life, and he would have been, of course, uh, aware that his own sister Shell was already in Coming to Man, um, um, with his brother uh, Michael Barry being in the the volunteers down in in Carlo. So, well, there's a lot more that can be said, I suppose, about Coming to Man and the Civil War, but I won't uh, digress. Of course, yeah, and I suppose even in the way that Kevin Barry was um, prayed for in that attempt for his reprieve, it is Coming to Man and. In particular, we can see the lines of women outside Mount Joy Jail in a way that I suppose really weaponized um, prayer and the rosary in a way that really shamed the British government. And I think no more than the McSweeney death the week before, what we see here is the British system of carceral justice really being flipped on its head for propaganda value in terms of retaining the dead. And Kevin Barry's example, taking uh, Terence McSweeney during his hunger strike over to Brixton, his, his example. So even yeah. the execution of James Daly well, in India. There's a difference though, because the, uh, somebody who's executed, it, 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 you know, it, it, they get buried in the prison grounds. So in some yeah. ways you could argue Kevin is nothing personal and the, 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 the other nine people of whom I feel sorry as for Thomas yeah. Trainer, the father, a father of 10. And I think it's extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. See, I'll be, I get, I was introduced to some Peter Foyle history meeting as a grand nephew of Kevin Barry. But there could have been trainers in the audience. No one would have said to them, are you anything to Thomas Trainer? Because yeah. basically he, he had 10 children, yeah. you know? 
But there's there's a tragedy for you. But can I just go? I know I'm moving on, being a bit naughty. But on this martyr business, I think to some extent the idea that that uh, Kevin of Irish Republican martyrology being all that different and exceptional and re very retro and very Catholic, I think we have to be careful. At what I've written, I start with the number of quotations saying he was fine and upright young man. He always a smile on his face. He he helped others less fortunate than himself, and this that and all this kind of old stuff. And my point is, this wasn't written about Kevin. This is written about old boys from Harrow and from mm. Eton and from Stonyhurst. Yeah. This was the language of the time. Anybody who was killed was held not to have been a terrific person, but to have been a better person than those who lived. And I think we do ourselves a disservice in terms of studying uh, Irish nationalism and the independence movement if we think that we are uniquely fixated yeah. and, and in a solely Catholic way. I went down two weeks ago down to, to Leeson Park, but I couldn't get into the, the Church of Ireland church there. In fact, apparently it's a Romanian Orthodox church now. I didn't know this. But in the, in, 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 the, in, the, in the grounds of the church, there's a fine big Celtic cross to the fall of 1914 to 1919. And that cross, like, it's explicitly dedicated. It dedicates the dead to God, right? And the, so, so we, we have to be careful in, in, in terms of, of thinking of, uh, as I say, of Irish Republican martyrology as being uniquely Catholic or being a uniquely almost kind of out of time because it is precisely the same language that is used uh, for, for the fallen uh, in Britain. You go into any Anglican church in Britain or whatever, any parish church, any Methodist church, you're going to find tablets inside, unlike Catholic churches, inside the doors listing the fallen. Uh, of, of Britain's colonial wars, of the First World War and of the Second World War. Thanks. Thanks, Eunan. Um, I think then in our final segment, we might go on to talk about commemoration and how Kevin Barry was commemorated at a state level. Um, Mary, I might go to you first about this idea of, I suppose, first, the ownership of the dead and secondly, the way in which that martyrology was constructed. Um, links back to Robert Emmett, which we see in the Kevin Barry window, that idea of Kevin Barry's body being moved at certain points in Irish history around the Republic being declared and whether that would be an appropriate time, much in the same way that that would be a time for Robert Emmett's epitaph to be written. Mm. Maybe even just looking first at, at the year 2001, do you think that was a point in Irish history where it was said with the Good Friday Agreement done with peace in the North, that now the state could maybe mark a termination of some of these hanging uh, question marks in Irish history? Well, I mean, I think that it was definitely, a, I mean, it, it, it was, as Schieffer said, a, a demand that had been going around for a long time. And I think it's maybe worth reflecting that a, that Arbor Hill, where the 1916 leaders are, was only opened on a, a you know, in a very selective fashion on, until well into the late 1940s. It's a relatively late arrival as, as, as a, as, as a public space as well. So my joy, you obviously couldn't do an Arbor Hill on it. So the reburial is, is an obvious way to go. And this, this had been deferred for a long time. If, if you look at the whole a commemoration or lack of commemoration from about the 1960s up to about the year 2000, uh, it's a very uncertain space where, where so, so much is not, is, is not marked for fears as to what its broader ramifications would be. And if you listen, if you listen to Cahal Daly was an Irish nationalist, uh, sympathetic to Irish independence, but one of those men who tried to draw that line that a lot of people, uh, I think Eudon was talking about it in terms of some, the, the, somebody he knew when he was at school, that there was a distinction between the old IRA and the generation who fought from the seventies onwards, and uh, that funeral was was a, an attempt to reopen that particular analysis and to say that there was a distinction, and this was a distinction that we would mark. And uh, I think the most important thing that came out of that commemoration was, was the sheer numbers, the fact that this was not just for the family, it wasn't just for a nerdy historians, it was something that did have a very wide popular appeal. 
and it showed that and the, the and the coverage around the funeral there were a lot of people who were really this is going to stir up extraordinary uh, visions of endorsement of physical force and incidentally the group i remember uh, I I arriving on mass into the pro cathedral was the Sinn Féin delegation which was massive you know really really strong uh, at the time but Basically, it was seen as a toe in the water. Could you commemorate a violent events of the early 20th century and do so uh, in a way that didn't reignite all kinds of other, other passions? And that funeral showed that, yes, it was possible. And I, and I would seriously argue it, it does provide a template for the a state re-embracing uh, the events of those years and beginning, to, and you, you get the doing up of the 1916 room in Cons Barracks as well and various other things like that, but they're all moving in the same direction. I think Bertie Ahern read that very, very well indeed. And as I said, Kevin Barry, I, I mean, there are 10 of them and I mean, I completely agree with Union on that, but Kevin Barry becomes the symbol of that. Mm -hmm. uh, reimagining or re, re return to state commemoration of that era. Thanks, Mary. Um, if anyone would like to jump in on any final points that they want to make. I think that that's very true, um, Mary. I, um, I wish very much, as I said, that I had been there and that there is there. It was made clear that there is a distinction um, between the, the IRA army of that time in the early 20th century and then the breakaway um, army in, in the North, so it appointed that we're not dem democratically mandated, that we're not um, accountable to Dáil Éireann at all. Um, whereas Kevin Barry and the IRA volunteers, they actually were. So they weren't reckless guerrilla fighters flinging grenades and shooting at British soldiers. It was a war and it resulted in somewhat in independence, which we have today. And if they hadn't done what they did, we'd be having to listen to Boris Johnson and pay council tax. So I'm happy about that and very proud. Eunan, any last words from you? Or? Uh, no, I, I, I think she, 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 for, she for, I, I agree with she, she for broad, broadly on this. I, I think the, uh, the specifics of, of getting the bodies out of Mount Joy, as, as she for, and Mary have said, there's, there's different families that would have had different takes on this. My grandmother would have maintained a, a purist Republican Robert Emmett type position, although she wavered from it, I think, when her friend Sean McBride went into government. But um, there was almost, I, I think, again, I don't say it at all of, of the rest of the Barrys, but I think in my grandmother's case, there was always almost a, an element of, 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 uh, satisfaction that they were being, that the body was still uh, effectively inaccessible because that made her point that the Republic hadn't been achieved. Oh, yeah. And yet, and yet, the only person she, she ends up refusing to deal with is Eamon de Valera. She quite happily will talk to Dick Mulcahy, bloody Dick, right? Once, once McBride goes into government with him. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. So civil war divisions my foot. She'll talk, hey. she, she's the only person she, she won't deal with is Dev. It's amazing. <laughs> anyway, sorry, that's a personal. Mary, you want to jump in there? Yeah, I was just going to say, and it occurred to me when Schiffer was talking and you were talking. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm going back to some, some. I, I had a certain involvement at the stage with uh, some of the some Dublin Archdi uh, archdiocese senior figures, and there was serious uh, unease in certain quarters in the Catholic Church about the state funeral and a Archbishop, a Cardinal, a Des Connell got an urgent excuse to go to Rome to avoid the whole occasion. And there was a, there was a major debate within the hierarchy as to who would take on the, the role of officiating at, at that, uh, at that is a state funeral and Cahill Daly a stepped in and did so my understanding is very wholeheartedly and with you know with with considerable support and did it with great acumen i must say yeah but 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 it, it, it was seen in certain quarters if you look at the newspapers there was a lot of unease about it not just right. in the church but otherwise as well and you you, you probably remember that union yeah i do yeah wasn't des connell didn't he go to belvedere 
He, yes, he did. Yes. Oh, See, the Jesuits are at it again. All comes back to that old school. Time. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, I know that time is pressing on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish up this recording and I'm going to thank everyone. So um, on behalf of UCD, you've been listening to Mary Daly, uh, Emeritus Professor of History at University College Dublin, Shifra O'Donovan, author, and Yunan O'Halpin, uh, Emeritus Professor of History at Trinity College Dublin, and myself, Connor Mulva of the School of History at UCD. I'd like to thank you for listening. I'd like to thank all our contributors, um, and I wish everyone um, a very a safe and happy time as we move through these uncertain times in our uh, world of remote commemorations. Um, and I will see you for the next one. Thank you, everyone.